And it's about rights and liberty. Uh, it provides an overview of the legislation governing the dep deprivation of liberty and the role of social services in making capacity uh, assessments. Um, the outcomes here is, are about describing and explaining relationships between legislation, regulation and codes of conduct, concepts of social justice and in particular in this instance human rights, and also sources or origins of British law on, on these topics and in other instances as well. So this is the first thing for us to provide some context. So when we think about the personal liberty um, of the, the private citizen and the power, the sovereignty of the state, I, I think of that as a, an evolving process within the modern nation. So the modern nation state is what it is because of the evolving relationship between the, the individual person's liberty and the authority of the state. This is um, uh, from the introduction of an important article published by Essex University's Autonomy Project on deprivation of liberty and the deprivation of liberty standards. So here we've got um, O'Shea saying that the, it's a fundamental con commitment of modern liberal states that we only detain citizens in accordance with a due process of law. And what that means is that the law has to be written in advance of the deprivation. The situ what you don't do is that the executive doesn't take away the liberty of the citizen and then go away and write the law to explain why that's okay. The law has to be written first and then it can be applied. And that's important because otherwise the person who is subject to the law had no way of knowing what the consequences were of their behaviour or their lack of behaviour or whatever before, it were, before the consequences were visited on them. Also, that due process has to be subject to periodic review. We, we, don't, we don't write individual laws in for perpetuity. They, they, they have to be reviewable because they may not have been well written in the first place or they may have only been appropriate under certain circumstances or at a particular moment in time. You know, We all know technologies have changed and therefore certain laws are no longer relevant or needed to be revised. Similarly, social responses and attitudes, values change and the laws that prevail have to be revised as well. Finally, there has to always be written, especially around significant legal processes which would take away our liberty, the individual has to have a right of lawful challenge built into the law that describes how their liberty can be taken. So if you're going to arrest me and imprison me, I have to have some kind of mechanism of appeal against that, otherwise it's not thought of as being uh, a liberal state's uh, legal system in operation. It's, it's more oppressive, more totalitarian. Um, these things, these principles, don't just govern imprisonment of people who break the uh, criminal code. It, it governs things like the management of uh, national security, both by the treaty arrangements that we have with other nation states, so things like extradition and rendition, but also uh, things like the control of the movement of people with infectious diseases because that would affect the, the domestic security of the state. The state will fall to bits if, if individuals wander around inside it, making everybody else ill. And similarly, not just infectious diseases, but we could also say things like groups who are involved with destabilisation of the state or terrorist purposes. OK, so that's what the Autonomy Project has to say about this. And this is the, the historical development then. So I would go back as far as the Norman Conquest and the writing of the Doomsday Book. And it's the book that matters in this, OK? So the, the monarch, William, takes control of the property, England, by power, by, by coercive force at a, in, a, in a number of battles, particularly Hastings. And having won, the monarch has himself crowned and then commissions an audit of the taxable properties that he's taken over so that he knows how much money he can get out of the properties that he's newly acquired. And the way that the economy worked in those days was essentially, it was an agrarian economy. Economic productivity was a consequence of serfdom, people working the land. And so if you're going to have any kind of predictability about how much money the land is worth, you have to keep people associated with properties. And that's why we had this serfdom. It, it's not straightforward slavery. The individual serfs sometimes had specific rights, rights of common usage and things, and but they also had responsibilities, so they weren't allowed to wander off, they had to stay where they were. 
they were, that, that's why they were acts against vagrancy and stuff. The serf was tied to the land in order to make the land predictably productive. Now, the people who owned the land on behalf of the king, who managed it, were the barons. And they'd, they'd come along with the Normans um, and taken possession on behalf of the king and paid over a certain amount of money from the holdings. And this money was used by the king to administer, you know, so here we are in the reign of King John or previous to him, King Richard. So they were administering their own imperial property, so the properties that they owned in France and other parts of Northern Europe, and of course in Richard's case, parts of um, the, the Holy Land as well. So that those processes drew money out of the barons, and if the king was able to draw that money out of the barons on whim, because of his power, because of his coercive authority, then the, all the power of the, the sovereignty of the state resided in the body of the king. But at the point where King John wanted to be able to draw money out of the, the holdings that the barons managed on his behalf, the barons were able to see that he was not able to force them, that they could force him to negotiate that. And that's what Magna Carta is. Magna Carta is the terms of negotiation about the raising of taxes, really. It includes a number of other things, some very important legal points, like a thing called uh, writ habeas corpus, so that the king isn't allowed to just, the monarch isn't just allowed to, to seize the body of the person. They, they have to have good reasons. It's like that due process thing. Kind of rejoinder from the monarchy on this point was the establishment of the Church of England under the Tudors, which reinforces the idea that monarchy has power by the will of God which led ultimately to the Stuarts having difficulties with trying to get the, the state to agree to that, and eventually Charles I being beheaded and the Commonwealth being established, which basically said, no, 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 the, the king, the monarch, does not have power in lieu of God's will. The monarchy has power because the state as a whole, the citizenry, recognise and invest that in him or her. Um, once that had been done, the Long Parliament established the, the procedures whereby it would meet regularly, it uh, established committees that would do certain things, it, it started to organise, really, the administration, the bureaucratic administration of the state. Once that had happened, the, the monarchy could be restored as a constitutional component. So we're quite happy to have a head of state, quite happy for it to be a monarch. It's just that the monarch couldn't have all of the power, all the sovereignty of the state residing in his or her body. Subsequently, the British had this thing called the Glorious Revolution, where William of Orange, a Dutchman, came to these shores um, and took over the failing, the, the last desperate failing efforts of the, the Stuart monarchy. They, they died out, really, I suppose. They, they hadn't managed to have enough successful children. So William of Orange turns up, and this raises this question about who is going to be the king in future. What, how is monarchy... How is the succession of monarchy to be decided? Now, traditionally, we've decided the succession of monarchy through battles and war. So competing royal houses have made claims about who's got the best descent. But really, it came down to who had the biggest army. The, the act of settlement was the state saying, never mind who's got the biggest army. From now on, the British monarchy must trace its descent to the body of a particular Hanoverian princess, which is why... George of Hanover, George I of England, came effectively from Germany, and why Queen Victoria and uh, the current Queen are essentially, they, they are a household of people from Germany, um, three or four generations ago. Once that, that act of settlement had taken place, we could expand the Union because we'd got stability. So this meant that the Scottish Parliament and the English Parliament could write two treaties, effectively, into their own law, which agreed that they would work together and be dissolved as separate sovereignties and come together as a single one. And we also extended franchise beyond the, the rights of baronial landowning peoples to people who owned significant property holdings, and then to people who owned uh, means of production, and then to people who just had a rational interest in the way the state was administered, up to the modern day situation where it's done on the basis of you are a competent individual of a certain age. Uh, irrespective of your gender, your ethnic heritage, the, the fact that you are a resident in these islands and that you pay taxes here and that you... All those kinds of things mean that you have an interest. 
And that increased stability meant that we had a great chance of being able to negotiate meaningful international relationships, things like the European Union, uh, North Atlantic Tre Treaties Organization, trade negotiations, and ultimately the United Nations Charter on Human Rights, which is like an international perspective on, on rights. So to summarize, we've gone from a position where power, sovereignty, resided in the body of the monarch to one whereby the state has seized that power and taken it away. So it didn't matter what line of arguments were put forward, in the end it was just more rational to have the sovereign power of the state separate from the individual body of a person. So that long line of development is this increasing bureaucratization of a rational legal relationship that's been encoded in a formal social institution or set of institutions that's Max Weber on the development of the state and, and the nature of power. Um, so now we're going to think about this thing, this the European Government on, uh, Convention on Human Rights. In particular, Article 5, our right to liberty and security. No one shall be deprived of his liberty save in the following cases and in accordance with the procedure prescribed by law. First of all, it is written in that old-fashioned sexist language of his. Um, it does apply, well, clearly it intends to apply to all. Um, I make no apologies, that was the, the language of the day. So these are the exceptions prescribed by law. Lawful detention of a person after conviction by a competent court. So if you are found guilty of having broken the civil or criminal code in some way, and the court says that the punishment that is due for that is for you to be imprisoned, it's okay for the state to deprive you of your liberty under those circumstances. Lawful arrest or detention of a person for non-compliance with the lawful order of court in order to secure the fulfilment of an obligation prescribed by law. So th this would be in situations where uh, I've been found guilty, bound over to keep the peace, say something like that, failed to live within the restrictions imposed on me by the court, and therefore I should be, obviously, have my liberty taken away from me and brought before the court again. Lawful arrest or detention of a person affected for the purpose of bringing him before the competent legal authority on reasonable suspicion of having committed an offence, or when it's reasonably considered necessary to prevent his committing an offence or fleeing after having done so. This is um, obviously to cover the, the activity of things like the police. If um, a, an executive officer of the state, the policeman, policewoman sees me doing something or running away from having done something or has got good intelligence to suggest I'm about to do something that would break the law, then they have to have the power to be able to take away my liberty and bring me before the courts. Um, there's the detention of minors, uh, children, by lawful order for the purposes of educational supervision or for lawful detention for the purposes of bringing them before competent legal authority. So um, that, that has to be done separately because we know under other articles under the uh, European Charter on Human Rights, children enjoy a different legal status, so you have to have a separate provision there. Lawful detention of persons for the prevention of the spreading of infectious diseases of persons of unsound mind, alcoholics or drug addicts or vagrants. This is the one that we're going to come back to and focus on in specifics. But finally, there's also the lawful arrest or detention of a person to prevent his effecting an unauthorised entry into the country or of a person against whom action is being taken with a view to deportation or extradition. And you remember from this stuff from the um, Autonomy Project, there was this, the, the reasons why the state can take away liberty were recognised as so we had that one and that one, but the, the the rest of this all covers the first one, which is the, you know to prosecute the law, basically. So the, that's what I'm saying here, is that all of these different features of um, Article 5 can be traced to this conception of the modern nation-state. Then when I look at that, I've got Michel Foucault into the case, pointing out that there's a sort of a curious thing, isn't there? Look at this relationship here between all these different things. So the spreading, the control of infection and also the regulation of madness, and also the regulation of vagrancy or, or residency. So this is, for Foucault, these would be all instances of where things are out of place. Vagrants aren't where they should be, they, they don't have a place to be. Um, unsound mind is very often constructed as being out of your mind. And infectious disease is where uh, organic agents are in the wrong place in, the, in my body when they should be outside of it or something like that. So, of course, there's the, the, the standard Foucault 
the Gaudian critique of, of that idea that is it really right and proper that we should consider all of these things to be comparable objects under the law. I set the Foucauldian critique to one side for a moment, but best not to forget these things, is it? So for our purposes then, we're going to be looking specifically at this business of persons of unsound mind. We've got two legislative frameworks in the British Isles governing the deprivation of liberty for people of unsound mind. Uh, the first and most obvious, the longest standing one, is the Mental Health Act, which we're only going to go back as far as the 1983 one, which is the currently active form of the Act. That, that describes these things. It's been amended subsequently, and, and it's always, you know, as part of that series of review, there are amendments and revisions made at all times to, to the Acts of Parliament. But it sets out when a person can be admitted, detained, assessed, and treated in a hospital against their will. And then we've also got the deprivation of liberty safeguards, dolls. Now, th there's a fundamental difference here. This tells us when the state can take away a person's rights to liberty, this here tells, tells the state more or less, or well, not necessarily the state, tells the, the depriving agent what they have to do to safeguard the freedom of the individual. All right, so Mental Health Act first. Um, we talk about sectioning in the Mental Health Act. You know, people would say, oh, he's, he's under a section. There's, there's nothing special about the Mental Health Act. All Acts of Parliament are written in sections. It's just that there are four... Well, there are four sections of the Mental Health Act which specifically describe the conditions and circumstances under which we can deprive somebody of their liberty. So these are those. There's the second section, section two, where I can deprive, or the state, or the agent of the state, can deprive the individual of liberty for the purposes of assessing where there is insufficient current, current diagnostic data to determine what care is required. So if we've got somebody who whose behaviour is clearly causing them to be at risk or causing others to be at risk of harm. So there's an elevation, a significant elevation of the risk of harm taking place. Well, under those circumstances, the state can say, OK, I'm going to take your liberty away from you just so as I can work out whether or not there's something we need to do. So this is just about assessment and diagnosis at the moment. There's another instance here where we can, we can take away a person's liberty in order to treat them. So imagine the situation where somebody has, has a long history of mental health problems, is well known in the local community, and is perhaps picked up by um, the local police force. And because they're well known, uh, they get a, the, the relevant people to come in and make the recommendations and, and put the uh, order under the section in place. Those people don't necessarily have to go through an assessment process every time. If it's well known that this individual is long-term suffering with paranoid delusions due to uh, very difficult to regulate schizophrenia, we don't need to make that assessment again. We need to get them in front of somebody for some treatment. So we just go for Section 3. Also, if we've conducted a Section 2 assessment and determined that the person has uh, a mental health problem that needs to be treated, we can go from Section 2 to Section 3. Finally, there's a Section 4 assessment. This is perhaps the one that people most often think of really, and that's when the situation is sufficiently um, urgent that we can't possibly delay at all. Now, in order to conduct a Section 2 assessment, uh, you'd have to have two independent mental health practitioners, well, medical practitioners, one of whom has to be specifically qualified, but we have to have two separate mental medical practitioners agree that the symptoms and signs of the, the relevant mental health problem are present. Are, you know, we can see that this person has reason, gives us reason to think that they are at elevated risk to themselves or to others because they have a mental health condition. If you can't, because the, because the case is so urgent, you know, it's late in the day, we haven't got access to enough expert staff, if you can't guarantee that, provided the case is sufficiently urgent, we can go with just one person to do that work for us, one mental health person. Um, and that's really, that's just a, a time-buying exercise. What you're supposed to do is apply Section 4, which should give you just enough time to be able to then go for a proper Section 2. Finally, the Section 5 doesn't really apply so much to work of social workers, but as well to be aware of all of them. If you are in hospital being treated for something and it becomes apparent to 
the, the physicians whose care you're under, that you are suffering from a mental health problem and that mental health problem leaves you at significant risk of harm or puts others at significant risk of harm, they have the power under the Mental Health Act, Section 5, to detain you for, for assessment and treatment. And there are two versions of that. There's 5.2, uh, where the, the medical practitioner, the doctor whose care you're under, can do that. And there's even a Section 5.4, <coughs> where if you're, if you're seeking to discharge yourself and the doctor isn't present, then the, the, the nurse who has responsibility for management of discharges, they can then seek your detention, but only for a very restricted period of time whilst they get a doctor to come and do a Section 5.2. So we can see that this process here is staged about by a number of different considerations, and they're all made on the basis of are you a risk to yourself or do you pose a significant risk to others? And if the answer to either of those questions is yes, and we can determine that the reason that risk is there is because you're suffering from a mental health disorder, then we're going to detain you against your will. So what do we mean by mental health disorders? Well, it could be a bunch of different conditions, and these are just an indicative list. You know, it was decided when the Mental Health Act was put together that there wouldn't be a prescribed list of mental health disorders because psychiatric practice is an evolving science. And people change their minds about how they describe, label, categorise mental health problems. So it doesn't do to have a, a list of them, because otherwise you have to be constantly revising the Act of Parliament. So these are an indicative list of the kinds of things that might give reason for. So schizophrenia, where a person has particularly lost touch with reality, they may well pose a threat to themselves, and also perhaps to others. Depression, if you're suffering with significant, severe depressions, then obviously you, you could be at risk of suicide or self-harm, neglect. Bipolar disorder, either on the upswing or the downswing of that, you can be at risk or you can pose a risk to others. Anxiety disorders, the obsessive compulsive disorders, eating disorders and personality disorders. And there's a bunch of others as well that might fit. The key thing is not the nature of the disorder, but the extent to which it means you pose a risk to yourself or others. So that the, the Act talks about the nature and extent. All right? So that it has to have a mental health origin, and the extent of risk elevation is the thing that matters. So I can have a mild obsessive compulsive disorder, you know, I need to, to wash my hands three times before I leave the house. That doesn't actually pose a threat to me or to anybody else. All right, now thinking about the deprivation of liberty safeguards. So the, the, the slightly newer stuff, so this is 2005. And there were subsequent amendments here again. There have been things that have been changed and updated about this too. So this is supposed to provide a legal prescription for the deprivation of liberty and also to outline the standards of safeguarding that take place around that. So if I do wind up in a situation where my liberty is gone, the people who are managing my situation are supposed to do their best to safeguard that limitation to, you know, so that it is minimally intrusive. So deprivation of liberty safeguards can only be used if the person will be deprived of their liberty in a care home or a hospital. In other settings, so if we were, if, let's say that we were, let's say we were looking to deprive somebody of their liberty in an open prison because we had a suspicion that they had developed, say, dementia or something. Well, then we would need to apply to the Court of Protection to have that person's liberty deprived. Um, if it was, There's no, no extension beyond the prescription of hospitals and care homes. And it really, it's because the Dolls was written thinking about advanced cases of dementia or... Um, progressive diseases that would deprive a person of capacity to make decisions on their own behalf. Um, care homes or hospitals must ask either a local authority or a health body if they can deprive a person of their liberty. So they can't make up this decision on their own. They have to notify somebody that this is what they wish to do and they're not allowed to do it unless that other, pod, that other body says, yes, we understand why and that's, that makes sense to us. So they do this by requesting a standard authorization. And in order to, to secure that standard authorization, you have to make six separate assessments. And these assessments have to be made by appropriately qualified people who are not themselves uh, forced into making these assessments in a particular way, so that they have to have a considerable amount of professional latitude and freedom to make these assessments. But the assessments are these. First of all, we have to show that the person has reached the age of consent, because as 
Article 5 showed us there are separate legislative frameworks dealing with younger people. So they have to be, in our society, 18 or over. Um, the, there has to have been refusal. So if, if, the person, if the person making the assessment says, but the, the person in this instance hasn't refused any of the care that's on offer to them, if, if I'm in a care home and the care home, my, my nurse says to me, well, what you, what you really need now is, uh, you need cannulization for uh, putting fluids back into your system, you've become dehydrated. If I say, oh yeah, well, go ahead and do that. That nurse does not then need to deprive me of liberty because I've, I've consented. I'm able to consent and I have consented. It's when I refuse that the, the deprivation of liberty thing comes in. I have to be of... I have to be able to make decisions on my own behalf. I have to have the capacity, I have to have mental capacity to do this. So if I have Alzheimer's or dementia, and this has so limited my insight into my own circumstances that I can't really tell what's best for me, then deprivation of liberty can take place. Mental health assessment has to be made. Um, this is conducted by an independent person. So, so far these assessments have all, or can all be made by the same person. It's usually a social worker or a qualified um, a health worker of some sort, but the mental health assessment has to be made by a medical practitioner who is appropriately qualified to determine whether or not, underneath the um, refusal to consent, uh, the refusal of treatment or whatever, is an underlying mental health issue. Because if there is, then more properly speaking, we ought to be looking for um, a mental health act uh, section rather than a deprivation of liberty safeguard. We have uh, an eligibility assessment to make. Clearly, if the person is in a care home and they're not eligible for the care that's being suggested for them, then there is no need to deprive them of liberty to administer that care because you can't administer it anyway, they're not eligible for it. And finally, we have to make an, uh, an assessment of best interests. Is the intervention being planned actually in the best interest of the person? Because we are only going to make this intervention against their will on the basis that they lack capacity. And that capacity is to decide to determine their own interests. So if we've determined that they aren't able to see their own interests, we now have to know that what's being planned and proposed is in their interests. Okay, so those are the, the assessments that have to be made for deprivation of liberty authorisation. If a standard authorisation is given, having had those assessments made, one of the most important safeguards is that the person has someone appointed with legal powers to represent them. Now this is normally, we always call this the relevant person, and it's usually a family member or a friend, but obviously if we're talking about people who are older, then they may not have so many family members who are in a position to be able to act on their behalf in this way. Um, they may not have a, a, a friend who is able to act on their behalf in this way because they may also have limitations of capacity. So under those circumstances, the um, local authority, if we're talking about uh, local authority authorization, or the primary care trust, if it's an NHS authorization, either of those two bodies will then appoint a paid independent mental health advocate, an IMHA, to do that work for them. And you have to have that person because it's this business about a right of appeal. So the person who is my um, representative in this is the, the person who administers and, and makes appeals on my behalf. Remember that we said, uh, the state can't deprive me of liberty without due process of law that is periodically reviewed and includes the right of appeal in some sense. So you have to have some kind of appeal mechanism. Now the Mental Health Act has appeal mechanisms built into it with specific times. So, you know, the, the section for um, restriction on your liberties only lasts for, I think it's 72 hours. Section 2 can only be extended to 28 days. And in those periods of time, there have to be a number of instances of review where the, view, the point of view of the person is taken into account and consideration. Under the deprivation of liberty, because these are really intended in cases where there is a long-term, ongoing and sustained lack of um, capacity. Well, obviously it doesn't make sense to build in sort of like, you know, in a month's time we'll look at it again. Because nobody gets better from Alzheimer's in a month's time, you know. In fact, we don't have something that gets us better. We have better management strategies, but it's not a curable condition. So if... if um, like a degenerative condition like Alzheimer's or dementia has robbed us of capacity, 
it's not likely to just magically come back. So we have to have representatives to stand in for us, and those representatives have to always have the capacity, the right, to appeal any decisions. So other safeguards, including rights to challenge the authorisation in the courts of protection, and this mustn't cost the person or the independent mental health authority, uh, advocate or their friends or family. It's got to be done for free, um, because obviously we can't make access to funds the, the condition of liberty. So those are the safeguards that, that are put in place around the deprivation of liberty that's put there, proposed and sought.